Services Engineer with Puppet Labs, uh, and today I want to talk to you a bit about uh, PuppetDB, which is this new central data store, well, relatively new central data store that we've come out with. Um, I think a lot of people are curious about what it is. We've been sort of hawking it a lot, um, but maybe not a lot of people understand why it's valuable or why you might want to use it. Uh, my contact info is there. Um, anybody can feel free to email me after this if you want a card. I'll give you a business card if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so uh, just a quick bit about myself, I'm a professional services engineer, so that means my job is mostly training and consulting. Uh, I, I live in New York City, although really I feel like more I live in Delta Terminals and various Marriott's, uh, travel a lot, so I'm rarely in town, um, but the Puppet NYC community is really great, so I like to hang out with you guys when I can. Um, so the DB in Puppet DB, by the way, does not actually stand for database. Um, it, it might, you might think that it does, but PuppetDB is a lot more than just a database. There is a database backend to it, um, but in general, it's a, uh, a sort of application data framework. So you get a REST, a REST interface and a way to query and write data um, into a central backend. And it's, met, it's designed for performance and scalability so that you can put lots and lots of data and read and write through it really, really fast. And it's meant to be the place where all Puppet data eventually ends up. Um, so, I mean, the goal ultimately in Puppet Labs, we're focusing on developing things for it. Uh, any sort of data store that needs to happen now, we kind of look towards PuppetDB first. And the goal is also that people in the open source community will be developing a lot more for it. Like, I think it would be awesome if it had form and support or something like that. Um, so, uh, a lot of interesting stuff like that. So, again, it's not, it's not just a database. Um, it comes with a few components built in. Most of this is running uh, on a Jetty server. There's a, a web server, a middleware queue, several um, uh, worker threads, and a database is essentially the core of it. And uh, those, uh, these, these things all in here are all part of this, uh, this Jetty interface. Uh, they run in the application server, and it's written mostly in Clojure. Um, I know there's a kind of a lot of hate for Java floating around out there. It's not actually running Java, it's running in the JVM. I know there's a lot of hate for the JVM out there too. Um, I should try to assure you that the reason why it was done this way is because it's really fast and there was a lot of domain knowledge uh, in writing enclosure. Uh, it was really easy for our developers to handle things like multi-threading and put all that stuff in there so that PuppetDB runs really, really fast and it's actually really efficient on memory use. So I saw before uh, a bunch of people raised their hands, they said they were sysadmins, and so I bet at least half of you hate Java and have had really bad experiences with the JVM. I'd like to assure you that that is likely not the case in PuppetDB, and there are plenty of ways that you can easily tune it to prevent it from going completely hog wild and trashing your system. Um, so the, the big challenge here is that Puppet generates tons and tons of data. Um, all this data gets generated, um, uh, for instance, like if you're running a small environment with about 100 nodes, if you're storing just your catalogs, and you have a pretty small catalog, like 800 kilobytes, um, every 30 minutes, if you're running that catalog on 100 nodes, you're going to generate about 3 gigs of data per day just on the catalog. And that's, that's only one of the interesting things about it. Um, if you're running a large environment, you just start adding zeros to that, because we're going to have customers you know, where there are sometimes over 750, some, somewhere close to a terabyte of data a day. Um, and this is a lot of information, so what do you do with it? Um, do you throw it out and just not use it? This, this data that represents everything in your infrastructure, right? For those of you who haven't used Puppet before, I mean, it's, it's running configuration runs uh, across your entire system. It's collecting data about all of your machines. It's making all kinds of decisions about what your catalog is supposed to look like and how things are configured. So this data is valuable, and you could probably do a lot of analytics with it, and it's not worth it to just trash it. But at the same time, there's so much volume 
And so, you know, what can you do with this? You can't just, you can't just, uh, you know, store it somewhere really easily. And so Puppet TV, TV was born to take care of that. So what kind of data am I talking about? When I say there's lots of data in Puppet, um, there's basically four things that it's meant to, meant to store. Um, facts and catalogs are two really big ones. So the facts are gonna have data about all of your systems before they're configured. And the catalogs is the state that Puppet says that it should be. Reports are essentially um, how that data, uh, how, that, how those uh, catalogs were applied and the success or failure of them. And then of course, exported resources, which I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about. So um, facts are generated by a tool called Factor. Those of you who have been using Puppet for a while are very familiar with it. Uh, this, is, this is a way that you get information about your node before you configure it. So facts contain data, like I've just got a whole sort of a dump out here. Um, things like your IP address, your kernel version, uh, what version of Puppet you're running, what your fully qualified domain name is. These are things that are really useful for determining how you're going to build the catalog and specify the configuration for a given server. Uh, and these get collected every single run. Um, so there's a, an inventory service built into Puppet right now that allows you to query these facts and PuppetDB is designed to replace that. So you can query directly from PuppetDB or go through the inventory service if you want to. But if, you, if you're running PuppetDB and it's configured correctly, every single run, these facts will be stored in, in that database and you'll be able to collect that data when you want to. So it's sort of like a built-in server inventory that's actually accurate because it was generated by your servers. So you don't need to worry about trying to keep a spreadsheet up to date or anything like that. Um, if you want to find out how many machines you have that are running a specific kernel version, it's really easy to do that quickly and pull that data out of PuppetDB. Um, so the catalog is sort of the core of how Puppet works. This is the thing that, uh, that, that Puppet uses to actually apply a configuration. So when a Puppet agent first requests uh, a configuration, it connects to the master, and the master goes through all of your Puppet code, right? And it, uh, it builds this catalog, which is a static representation of what the state of that system is supposed to be. So um, when the agent runs, it basically compares its existing state to the state that's defined in the catalog, and if there's any differences, it will correct them. Right? So that catalog is, is really valuable. It says exactly what your entire infrastructure is. And it contains tons of information about what kind of resources you have, um, you know, things like what files and services you're running, and what the dependencies between them are. So the catalog data is really valuable. It's another thing you don't want to throw out. And this is something that can start to grow a lot. As your systems become more complicated, as you have um, more components to manage, your uh, infrastructure is, is going to generate a lot of data about this sort of thing. And so again, you need a place to store it. So, Exported resources are, uh, are something that a lot of people who maybe aren't uh, very frequent Puppet users um, might not be familiar with. This is essentially the way that you get data from one node and apply it onto another one. So in this example, I'm exporting a, uh, a host name. We've got uh, this two at symbol character here. This is how Puppet knows that it's an exported resource. Uh, and we have the fully qualified domain name of the machine that we're exporting the host resource from. Uh, the alias is just going to be like a short name for that for that host, and then IP is the IP address. So we're we're exporting a line for our host file. Um, that resource by itself will not be applied on the machine that's doing a puppet run. Okay. So once that data gets exported, uh, it goes up to the puppet master and it gets stored in some kind of data or some kind of database. Um, prior to Puppet DB, this was stored in a MySQL backend connected to via Active Record, uh, and it was actually really slow. So the active record database, um, once you get to be around maybe 50 or so nodes, uh, 50 to 100 nodes, it starts to get really slow. Your Puppet Master starts to slow down significantly and you start to have failed catalog runs, things like that. Connections start to fail. So um, after the resource is exported, other hosts that want to actually apply it have this uh, thing we call the spaceship operator. We do this, we call it collecting the resource. So it takes all of those resources down and then applies it on itself. So if every machine has a catalog like this or a puppet code like this in their catalog, they're gonna end up having a host file entry that can resolve any other host in their infrastructure. Uh, it's, really, it's really handy, the host file one is maybe not the best example. And here's just sort of a quick diagram to show how this stuff works. Uh, this machine here would have that little at at bit, you know, like that at at host. It exports it to the puppet master which loads it onto a database. And then um, when all these other ones do their puppet runs, they're going to apply all of those exported resources. Um, maybe for hosts it's not so valuable because some of us like to use this little thing called DNS. 
uh, to be able to do to do resolutions. And I actually don't recommend that you export all your host resources and apply them. Uh, get a DNS server, seriously. Um, but some other things are actually really helpful because when you bring up a machine, there's all kinds of dependencies that sit around elsewhere in your infrastructure. Uh, say, for instance, your monitor. Uh, if you want to monitor that host, you don't want to have to go and add something to your Nagio server configuration every time you bring a new machine up. You want to be able to export that configuration in the puppet code where you say, hey, this machine needs to get monitored, it needs this sort of thing on it, and then just trust that the Nagio server will somehow get that data applied on it. So here we have a couple built-in resources into Puppet, uh, a Nagios host and a Nagios service. We're going to export both of these from a system and essentially say in here that we want to have a ping check on that machine on the Nagios host. Um, this actually, I shamelessly stole this example from the Pro Puppet book. Um, it's a pretty good one though. I found not a lot of people use it because, again, uh, in older iterations of Puppet, without Puppet DB, you're using store configs, and this actually gets really slow. You could actually end up crashing your Puppet Master because you're not, um, because you're using something just simple like this. You get a lot of resources and they get all messed up and then uh, everything slows down and you don't get your Puppet runs and you're really sad. So you stop doing that and you start going back to manually configuring your audio services, which sucks. Um, so we can export all these hosts like this and then on the actual Nagio server we just have a piece of code like that that just applies it. So we say here that we collect every Nagios host resource and every Nagios service resource and when any change happens to these on the uh, Nagios monitoring server, we refresh the Nagios service. So it restarts and gets that configuration loaded. And so this way we can have all of our machines monitored without having to go to uh, the Nagios service and edit each and every single one of them. Yep. So every time they export a resource for the previous night, mm -hmm. uh, every time it runs, does it create a new record on the database or it refreshes that record? So the first time that it runs, it will add that record in. It won't re-add it every single time. Now the master will see it and try to add it, and actually, that actually becomes one of the bottlenecks in active record. Um, but as we'll see in a minute with Puppet DB, it actually can do this in parallel and do it really, really fast. But so we you, don't have performance issues. Is it there? just one out of thing? Right. It won't rewrite it in there. I mean, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, it will make the connection to the service, and the database will know whether it's there or not. Um, but it's not. It's not going to add a lot of extra I/O. Um, so. One, one other thing about exported resources, and I find a lot of people actually don't know about this, um, when you remove a node, you need to make sure that you delete it. So I just kind of threw this in here. It's got not much to do with Puppet DB. Um, but you run the command puppet node deactivate, and that will actually connect to the resource service and remove that node from the database so that further Puppet runs won't continue to add that resource. So if you've got a resource exported and you don't want it managed all the time, uh, after, you remove that, after you remove that node, just run this command to remove it. Sure. Is this the same thing in Puppet Dashboard when you just say delete? Does it do the same thing? Um, I believe Puppet Dashboard does delete the node from the record there, yes. Um, yeah, it does something similar. Uh, so, how does this all actually work in Puppet DB? So, quick intro. This is, this is kind of what your Puppet DB architecture would look like. Also, slides shamelessly stolen from Deepak, uh, the lead developer from Puppet DB. Um, You've got your, eight, your puppet agents, probably many of these, and you've got your puppet master that has these things that we call terminuses, or termini, I guess would be the plural of terminuses. Um, so each one of these terminus, each, each terminus is a place where, where data goes on the puppet master. These are built in whether you're using puppet DB or not. So the fax terminus is when you get fax in, they go to the fax terminus. When a catalog is built, it goes to the catalog terminus, and when resources are exported, they go to the resource terminus. So all of this data is, all of these, uh, configuration points you can set in your puppet.com file or in a routes.yaml in your Etsy Puppet Labs Puppet, uh, puppet directory. Um, so each one of these terminuses gets configured in a different way. The old way had active record for each of these. And so you would connect essentially to a MySQL database using a single threaded Ruby process that could easily block and slow down the entire master. <coughs> So um, when you're running Puppet, D oh, so these other um, configuration, these other uh, components here, right? If you recall, I was mentioning there's a web server, a middleware queue, um, several workers, and a database. And then we've also got this thing here called the DLO or Dead Letter Office. Uh, and I'll get uh, you know, I'll get to that in a minute about what that DLO does. Um, so say we have an agent, it wants to request a configuration. So it collects a bunch of facts about itself. It's got its IP address, it's got its host name, its MAC address, all that good stuff. Uh, and it requests a catalog from the master and sends its facts up there. So now the master has the facts, it wants to begin compiling the catalog. But first, 
We're going to store all of these onto what we call the inventory service so that we have this data for later so we can query it. Um, so the master is going to send these facts up to the web interface uh, and start to build the catalog par in parallel. So it's really quick here. It just connects to the web service, sends the facts up there, and then PuppetDB will take over. So in the previous active record iterations, it would actually have to wait until the inventory service completely loaded that loaded those facts into the database before it could continue to compile the catalog. But here, it's doing this all in parallel. So it sends the facts up and starts compiling the catalog, and it doesn't need to wait for a database call. Okay? So next, um, the catalog gets built. The master sends the catalog up to the HTTP service as well, after this has already sent the facts into the middleware layer. So this middleware queue is what gives PuppetDB Puppet its, uh, its parallel nature and then it can just write these messages onto here constantly. And it doesn't need to wait for I.O. from a database or anything like that. So this is kind of one of the reasons why it's so fast. All of this, by the way, here is happening in multiple threads. So it can go really quickly. Um, so the catalog goes to the web service. The catalog is on, is, is on the master. Uh, the facts are in the middleware layer. And then we've got these workers running here. So a worker is going to pick up these facts. Uh, as well as the HTTP service in parallel submitting the catalog to the middleware layer. So because all this stuff is running in separate threads, nothing's blocking, nothing's waiting on all this stuff. So we can easily just keep throwing data at this thing and it's going to be able to load it. And of course, while all this is happening, the agent has already gotten its catalog and it's now starting to apply it. So your agent configuration has, has no problems, it's not slowed down, it's not waiting for all this stuff to process through some backend database, as was the way with Active Record. Um, and now we have uh, all this stuff starts to flow through PuppetDB. So the workers put the facts into the database. They now connect to the Postgres layer, and when they're done with that, they grab the catalog. And then they process the catalog. They do some data transformations on it. Um, if you have exported resources in your catalog, it's going to extract them and load this stuff finally all into the database. And so now, after that puppet run, we've managed to successfully export these resources, and it's all happening really fast as though there were no exported resources at all. Okay. So here, the performance impact of writing these exported resources has disappeared. You can do this thousands of times faster than you could have done with Active Record. Okay, so the actual collection piece of that, how does that work, right? So we've completed a Puppet run, another agent is ready to start up its run, and we've got these resources stored in PuppetDB. Um, so the first thing, of course, the agent does is it collects its facts and sends them up to the Puppet Master, okay? So Puppet Master got the facts, it's going to, it's going to start compiling its catalog, um, but there's a resource collector in here. So the agent can't compile it, or the master cannot compile the catalog until it's found out what these resources that it's supposed to collect are. So remember we exported and it needs to load them all into the catalog so that it can apply them onto this new agent that's requesting them. You know, this is your Nagio server, this is your machine that wants to have its host file filled out, this is your SSH keys, these are your load balancer pool members, things like that. Um, so the master, request from the HTTP service to give it the facts, and the HTTP service actually goes directly to the database. The, um, the reading here is actually pretty quick, too. Uh, again, it's all happening multi-threaded. Multiple catalog compilations are not going to block on this, so still much faster than active record. So it requests the resources, um, gets the resources back from the HTTP server, and then pulls them back to the resource terminus. So now we have these resources, we move them in, and we compile the catalog. Combine the exported resources with the facts, and we get the catalog. It goes back to the agent, and the agent, of course, while this is happening, the catalog gets shipped back up to the service, and the whole thing begins again in parallel. Okay? Any questions about this process so far? Rob? When the catalog gets sent to the, the agent, the agent doesn't query the, the database at all, does it? No, the agent never touches the database. That's always between the master and puppet DB. So does the database, can that be on the Puppet Master? It usually is. In fact, I'll, I'll just like poke around a bit later and I have it set up in the demo lab. Um, yep. Are, is all the information needed to generate the resources in the facts? No. So to generate the resources, you've written Puppet code to specify what you want them to look like. I, I didn't see where it was sent over from the agent to the, the master. So in Puppet, all of, the, uh, all, of that, all of that stuff lives on the master already. You define the you define your nodes in Puppet code on the master. But something has to read Etsy posts and, and publish what's in Etsy posts to the master, right? Well, no. So in the example that I was showing, it actually writes to Etsy hosts. Like that that data gets created. We're specifying what it's supposed oh, okay. to be. It never actually looks there. Okay. Okay. 
So I mean, that, that host is running on the agent, produces information into the facts, and those get put on the master. So, so it's actually a bit more, uh, let's, let's pop back here. Um, so this at, at host thing, yeah. the reason why it has these values that it can fill in the uh, FQDN and the host name IP address stuff, um, that's because these values come from the facts. Oh. So the fact that we want to specify a host and how the host resource is oh. supposed to look, that's defined on the master. I would write all this code on the master. I thought it was reading Etsy host. No, no, it's not. So the reading Etsy host comes because the puppet resource, before it will apply that host line, it checks to see if it exists already. But that all happens entirely on the agent side. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not collecting this data from uh, like what you're supposed to do. Yeah. The whole the whole thing with puppet is that you define this all centrally. You say in one place what you want your service to look like. Let me uh, see if I can get back here. Let me skip the animations. Uh, Okay, so what happens when something goes wrong in this process? Like, you don't want to lose this data, especially with things like exported resources, where that could be a really important piece of your infrastructure configuration. It's not just something that you're looking at for, for your own interest. Um, there, that's where this, this DLO comes in. So the design here was kind of inspired by mail servers, where you can retransmit, uh, where you can retransmit on failures, and you basically just keep trying over and over again until it, until it finally works. So again, we start with the same process. Agent generates facts, sends the facts to the master. Master generates a catalog and sends the facts to the HTTP endpoint. Um, we're doing just a normal puppet run here. The uh, catalog goes to the HTTP endpoint too. Uh, the facts get loaded into the worker queue, and then, oh no, the database broke, or we ran out of disk space, disk space when we tried to process this, or you know, maybe the network connection to the database went down, or something like that. So we can't, we can't get that fact loaded in for some reason, so we kick it back to the middleware layer. Now, the, the workers continue to process as normal. So say this condition resolves itself, we're able to get the catalog and push it back in, uh, but these facts are stuck at the end of the queue. So uh, we go to process the facts, and the workers pick them up again, and then maybe for some reason it fails again, or maybe there was something malformed in those facts in particular, and so we can't actually parse the data correctly and load it to the database. So it kicks it back to the middleware layer, and this is just like a mail server, where it tries to send it once, it fails, so it tries again maybe two seconds later, then it tries again four seconds later, and then eight seconds later. Um, I think it, it's, it's a bit faster than a straight exponential um, increase in the timeout time, but PuppetDB will essentially retry this process uh, 16 times, which comes out to about eight hours trying to store this data, and then if it still continues to fail, it kicks it to this dead letter office, which is a place where, we can, where you can have that data, and it is the exact full format of the transaction. So if you run into something like this, you can send that to support or you can you know, send it to someone on a mailing list and we can help you uh, figure out exactly why it failed and maybe there was a bug or something in PuppetDB that needs to be corrected. So you've got the full text of that transaction, it can be replayed somewhere else and it's all right there. So you don't actually lose the data. Yep. Format is stored in. Um, I believe that gets stored uh, in the database and there's a way to export it. Is there an endpoint for monitoring the DLO? Um, I believe so. Yes, and so you can actually you can actually monitor all of this. I'm going to show some uh, some query metrics later. The querying is actually I think one of the coolest parts of PuppetDB, uh, and there's ways that you can check on all that. Um, so yeah, complete content of all the failed transactions. So how do we actually go about and get this thing installed? It's actually really really easy because we have Puppet modules written and available on the Forge that will just pretty much do it for you. So your PuppetDB server needs to have Puppet on it. Uh, PuppetDB relies on the certificate layer that Puppet provides, so uh, if you don't have Puppet, it can't really work. Um, not that you would have a PuppetDB server and not have a Puppet agent on all of your machines anyway. Um, so you install Puppet first, um, enable the Puppet Labs repos. We have RPMs and dev packages that you can just install to get those repos in. Uh, if you're not the type of organization that likes to hit public repos, you can easily just mirror them down. Uh, those contain a couple of important packages, specifically the, uh, the PuppetDB package and the PuppetDB terminus package, uh, which are used to configure both of those, both that terminus on the Puppet Master, uh, and also the PuppetDB service itself. Um, so then you just you can just use the module tool, Puppet Module Install Puppet Labs slash PuppetDB. This will work on both enterprise and open source. Um, the uh, the repos themselves are actually going to have separate packages for the enterprise or open source versions. Um, but both of them will work fine with this module. We'll check which kind you have. And then all you have to do is classify the server. 
So in this example, I just have a bit of code that says that the Puppet Master is the Puppet DB server. I have this Puppet DB class that sets up all of the Puppet DB components. That builds, you know, all the Jetty interface with all of those neat little uh, things stored in there, uh, as well as uh, setting up a default database. So by default, this goes as Postgres. Um, there is an HSQLDB that's available if, uh, as sort of like a demo version, um, but typically that's not performing past around 100 nodes or so. Um, so that sets up Puppet TV, it sets up the database, all of this on the same server, and then it configures your Puppet Master to actually use it. And it does that by configuring all the terminuses, it sets the routes.yaml, and it updates your puppet.com file to actually point everything to Puppet TV. Yep. Uh, quick question, does it also work with uh, NoSQL da databases as well or no? No, it doesn't. So doesn't? right now, it only works with Postgres and HSQL. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plans to potentially support other databases in the future, but there's a certain set of features that are needed for it to work. Uh, in particular, this is why it doesn't work with MySQL. Yep. Is it clean active record, or is, it or is there a Postgres-specific crap floating around in the code base? Um, so the actual database interaction is done in Clojure, so there's not any active record. Uh, or is that, or what, uh, okay, is it all done with an abstraction layer, or is it done, you um, know, straight Postgres? So it's it's a bit of both. There there is some somewhat of an abstraction layer, but a lot of it is done through Postgres. You typically don't actually interact with the Postgres database. Yeah. So um, you interact with the Closure or web web interface, and that's how. Uh, I'm just trying to get a feel for how yeah. far down the road the uh, database would be. A question like that, I probably would have to refer you to a developer. I'm more of a user of this. Yeah, um, I'm just coming from an organization that doesn't let you go to public repositories to get stuff, and organizations mm -hmm. like that often, you know, with the stance of open source, you know, relational database. So, I mean, if, okay. there's, if there is a database I think that's likely to be supported in the future, it's actually probably going to be Oracle. Yeah. The, the, the feature, as I understand it, that's missing is uh, array columns. Uh, that MySQL doesn't have, so I, I believe Oracle does support that, so that may come out at some point yeah. in the future, but no promises. Okay. Um, if, if you're in an organization that doesn't like open source things, though, I wonder how you're using Puppet. Open source uh, things, yes. Uh, okay. Database. You know, okay. it's not so much the open sourceness, it's the you know, number of vendors. Gotcha, that's good to know. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so when you want to actually start to scale this thing, and this, this is where it actually does become helpful to understand what these various components are in here, um, there's uh, the first thing you want to do is move off of HSQLDB. If you're using that, which is sort of just a demo one, which the Puppet module, by the way, by default will not set up for you, that's the first thing you need to do if you start to have bottlenecks at the Puppet DB layer, is move to an actual Postgres machine. Uh, the next thing you can do is actually separate the Postgres server. So. Uh, the module automatically does Postgres or HS SQL? The module automatically does Postgres. Okay. So if you do it like this, you've got Postgres. Okay. Uh, you can you can tell it to not do that, and you can set up the database separately. In fact, this module is broken out, but you can specify almost every component separately if you really want to. Um, so the next thing would be to, to separate Postgres. Um, this, by the way, is assuming if Puppet TV is actually your bottleneck, you probably also want to move it off of your Puppet Master first, um, so that they're not fighting for CPU time. Uh, Puppet DB is designed to be heavily multi-threaded, so actually when it's running and it's, it's really cranking, it could use every core on your system. And it's designed to do that specifically so that it doesn't block on any one thread. Um, so, so the next thing you do after your Puppet DB server is separate, you, you're running Postgres instead of HSQLDB, it's still really slow. Um, a separate Postgres server is possible. Now granted, I, I, should, I should emphasize that on all of these scaling options, this is like you're talking many thousands of nodes before you have to even think about this. One reasonably spec po uh, Puppet TV server should be able to handle almost anything you throw at it. It is, again, really, really fast. Uh, and the cumulator makes it so that even if stuff starts to back up a little bit, it doesn't actually make the system slow down or impact the catalog compilation time on the master. Um, so you separate the Postgres server. Um, the Puppet DB web interface will then connect back to that database. And this is, again, also very easy to do with the Forge module. You just specify the, a different parameter when you call the Puppet DB class. Uh, so you separate the Postgres server is the next thing, and then you can also have separate Puppet DB servers all connecting to the same Postgres backend. So you can split these out in front of a load balancer or something, and have each one that's running the uh, the closure jetty piece uh, with the middleware and all that, all connecting back to, the, to a same central database. Uh, and then finally, you can also cluster Postgres. This isn't even really a feature of Puppet DB; it's a feature of Postgres, and that you can spread that database out over multiple over multiple machines. Something that's actually much harder to do in MySQL, which is the reason why I'm glad we're getting off of that. 
Uh, and then finally, if, if it's really crazy, if you've got a really like a lot of network load coming in here, you can even put HTTP proxies in front of the Postgres, or sorry, in front of the PuppetDB server. So there's a lot of options. You can pretty easily easily scale it out. I think this is actually a lot easier to scale than um, than uh, other Puppet components. Maybe not the master. So the real meat of it, and I think that this is this is kind of my favorite part of it, is how you can actually query this data. So you're not writing Postgres queries, you're not connecting to the database directly, you're connecting to PuppetDB the same exact way that the built-in tools connect to PuppetDB. And so we have all these, uh, all these different query interfaces available. So by default, it's going to listen on um, localhost on port 8080 if you use this, uh, that same sort of module setup. Um, it's also going to set a public listener on port 8081. Uh, you can reconfigure this and say how that's supposed to work. I recommend that your public listener is, is enabled on SSL. Uh, again, by default, it will do this, so um, you're not gonna have some unauthenticated connection set out. Uh, this SSL connection that it sets up also is using the Puppet um, certificate authority to, to sign and authenticate clients. So if you're connecting to the SSL listener, you can use your Puppet certs, and I'll show an example of how to do that with curl in a little bit. Um, but this is using the same certificate SSL structure as your actual Puppet system is. Um, so again, um, as I was saying before, when you send a query to the HTTP service, it gets processed immediately. Um, when you query something, it actually goes HTTP to the database and then spits it right back at you. You saw that before in the example with the uh, resource collection. So if you make a query to PuppetDB, you get the response back pretty much right away. Uh, if you send a command, however, that command needs to go into the queue and then get picked up by a worker thread. Now commands are things that you would use to actually write to the database. Typically you wouldn't be doing that, you'd be letting some sort of puppet, uh, puppet process handle that for you. So the master is gonna be writing to the database, you'll just be querying it to get that data back. Um, all of your query responses come in JSON, and depending on what kind of query you've made, there's gonna be a different type of JSON string that you get that data back from. Um, it's, not, it's not like a super human readable thing unless you consider JSON to be human readable. Um, but it's really, really easy to process uh, with a machine. So uh, I think like one of the, the big goals of PuppetDB is to enable application developers to actually do stuff and you know do some crazy serious number crunching uh, with the data that you get out of that. That's obviously not for me to do, but somebody hopefully somewhere um, uh, uh, will be able to get that. So the JSON is really easy for you to parse and with all those sorts of data libraries. So one of the first ones I want to show you is just a fact name query. Um, this is just a REST endpoint, so we would query at like HTTP colon slash slash whatever the host name for the PDB server is uh, and look for the v2 slash fact names. Uh, notice that this is also version, so if we come out with new API versions that you know start to deprecate older features or change things, you can still hit the older API. Um, uh, this is sort of something that like all of the interfaces within Puppet are, are sort of aiming to take on in the future. Uh, so you see with things like Puppet Faces and things like this where we version all of these API calls so that your, your applications won't break when we upgrade things and we have to release new features. Yep. What kind of long-term plans do you have for supporting all the API versions? Um, I do not. Uh, in fact, I probably doubt that there are any specific ones. Generally, we've just been supporting things until it becomes impossible to support them. At uh, some point in the future, we probably will be releasing more specific roadmaps that say when things will be phased out, but I think we've been pretty bad at phasing out APIs in general. Uh, there's a lot of stuff floating out there that's really old that we still support, which I personally think is crazy, but I'm sure that you guys who are still running like Puppet 024 are pretty happy about. Um, so anyways, this, this uh, REST endpoint gives back uh, a list of back names. So, there are a bunch of core facts that ship with Puppet, lots of ones that are built in there by default that are really useful, and for maybe 90% of people, that's enough. Uh, but a lot of other people choose to write custom facts. And so when you wanna see what kind of data is actually available in your system, you can't just assume that whatever facts Puppet shipped with are the only ones you can use. So this fact name query will give back all of the facts that are available on your PuppetDB server right now. So all the, thing, all the facts that you have data for. It just fits back a JSON array, it's just a list of the fact names. Pretty straightforward. Um, once you have that list of fact names, you can query some even more interesting things. So the facts terminus itself will give back data about facts. You can search based on the name of the fact or the name of the fact and the value. So here, this one, it, with no other filtering, will give back every fact value that you have on the system. And it comes back in a JSON with, uh, with the cert name, the name of the fact, and the value. 
So if you just if you just hit V2 facts, it's going to give you everything. Every machine, every fact, every value for everything. Obviously, that's a lot of data. So you can filter that down just within the URL by specifying a specific fact name at the terminus, or sorry, at the endpoint, or a fact name and a fact value. So that last one is really helpful if you want to say, how many machines do I have that are running Linux 2.6 or something? And get all those kernel versions or anything like that. Um, so resources is another really helpful endpoint. You can query these and find out resources that came from those catalogs. Uh, so if you recall before when uh, PuppetDB takes this catalog in, it processes it and chops it up. All of those catalogs are basically just lists of resources and their dependencies. And so you can find out what resources are out there floating around really easily. Similar to facts, you query slash resources to get all the resources. You can also query these by resource type and by resource title. Uh, and this gives back similar data in terms of uh, full chunks of the resource as well as the cert name that it's on, the line of code that it comes in on, all of the parameters that that resource has set in the catalog, the title, the type, the cert name that it exists on, and all of these things you can also filter by. So if you want to see a list of machines that are uh, that came from a particular module, for instance, it's really easy to pull that data out. You can filter based on which parameters you have available. So you want to see every service of a certain name and what the status was set on in Puppet. You can pull that out. This is, I think, one of the, one of like the, the most useful ones, and I really suggest people to just play around with it because there's lots and lots and lots of data you can get. And if you just start to get creative, you see that there's all kinds of information you can glean about your infrastructure just by hitting these rest points manually with a curl command. So imagine you know, what you can do if you start to automate that and actually perform some real kind of analytics on it. So it's really neat. I'm kind of, I was kind of excited the first time that I saw that. Um, so to query nodes, um, uh, this one actually goes also from the catalog data, but this is uh, node focused instead of resource focused. Um, you can hit V2 nodes and get a list of all the nodes that you have. You can search by node name and get all the details about the facts and the uh, resources that were on that node. Uh, same thing, you can hit node name slash resources and get only the resources, or node name slash facts and get only the facts. Um, really, really useful stuff. So a bit more about the queries. Um, all of those that I showed before where you hit the endpoint directly, you're just sort of, you're just sort of blasting, you know, kind of raw at the whole thing. You want to get every piece of data that that endpoint provides. Uh, you can filter that down a lot more. Uh, so when I say endpoint, I'm talking about the URL. It's a REST endpoint that you're connecting to to pull that data out from. Um, there's also queries that you can add to this as part of the data section of your GET request. Did I see a hand go up? No? Okay. Um, so this is kind of what the query would look like. I sort of broke it down line by line. You have the URL you're connecting to. You have the version of the API. You have the endpoint that you're trying to get the data from. And then you have URL encoded this query string. So, these queries are written in infix notation. They have to be JSON, okay? And there's, there's a list of operators that they support. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, but we just have here this query equals and then a JSON array with three items to specify how you're gonna, how you're gonna search for that. Uh, anybody here familiar with, with prefix notation? So the difference between this and like infix notation, uh, you might be used to cert name equals myhost.com. Prefix notation just puts the operator before all of those items. So when you're writing these queries, you just you know, do it like that. And so you can make even more complicated ones. Um, supports Boolean operators. Here we just say if the type equals service and the title equals HTTPD, this would be some kind of a resource query that we want to submit. Um, the, uh, the white space here doesn't really matter. You just URL encode the query and then you can pull it out. So, yeah. Is the reason for the, is, this is like reverse Polish notation, is mm -hmm. it because of the closure? Um, the PuppetDB is actually running closure. Is that why? I, I think it actually has to do with a combination of the closure and the way that they uh, they do the uh, array columns in Postgres, but I'm not sure. I haven't actually written either. So, why does closure use uh, uh, reverse Polish notation? Yeah, it's kind of what it's based on. Yeah, so that actually makes a lot of sense that that would be why this is there. Wouldn't this be forward Polish notation? Reverse would be the e thing at the end. I get confused and I, I worry if I say mm -hmm. Polish notation, I'm going to get in trouble, so I just say prefix notation. It's working as postfix. Okay, well, prefix notation, and then there's no argument. Um, so, was that, oh, sorry, another question? Someone's just scratching their face and I like catch it out of the corner of my eye. Uh, yeah? Since it, since since queries in code written that way uh, probably aren't very human readable, mm -hmm. or very, you know, bored. They, they don't expect that to fly off the fingers. Um, 
is there is there a gem for this? Is there is there a um, to public DB yet? There there's not a, a gem that I know of, but there is something else. There's a, a face that makes this a bit easier that was written by Eric Dahlin. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a sec that makes it a bit easier. Uh, typically, when I write these, I don't actually like type the whole thing out of the yeah. command line, and I actually don't think that this is that bad to read. You know, if you have proper indentation and all that, it's pretty easy to tell what you're searching for here. Yeah. Uh, I could just be crazy. I know I'm not bullish. Uh, <laughs> I prefix. Uh, it's, probably, yeah. it's probably taken from this as expressions, yeah. the, the, which is a way to write these things without using tons of parentheses. Mm. Yeah. It's some, something other than. Yeah. Well, so I, I do have an example for you, especially if you're querying it manually, you don't like it easier. You don't like the JSON part of your query. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't mind it being JSON by the time it hits public DB. I just hope that it's, you know. So the actual query, the actual query interface for this is, is all in JSON. Uh, that, that granted is not designed specifically yeah. for human interaction. It's meant for, you know, your automated process, which JSON is actually really good for, I think. Um, I, I've got an example for you that I think we're going to be on that one later. Um, so, so these are the operators, the various operators that you have. Note that not all of these operators work for every query type. So sometimes uh, there, there are certain types of queries where like the regex match doesn't work or where greater than less than doesn't work. Um, and it will just not return values if those queries aren't valid, if those operators aren't valid. Or it will actually return an error that says that um, that operator is invalid for that particular query type depending on how it's invalid. Uh, that's all documented, by the way, so um, you don't need to ask me right now. Um, so here's an example of actually querying this. Um, as I was preparing for this talk and as I've been playing with PuppetDB, uh, I ended up writing a lot of curl commands. So I just, I think it's kind of helpful to understand exactly the specification here. And maybe if you, if you haven't used curl very much, aside from to like download a copy of a tarball or something, um, it's nice to know some of these options. So first we have a curl-g, which just specifies we need this to be a get request. Um, only certain command endpoints, I believe, actually support post. And you'll get weird errors about not being able to, uh, this endpoint does not support post if you exclude the dash g and you include data. So the dash g will force you to actually put your query data into the body of the request and not just at the end of the URL, which is where PuppetDB expects it in the body. Um, so the uh, dash h accept adds this header into your request that says that you accept application JSON. If you omit that, PuppetDB will say you must accept application JSON. Always, it's not going to automatically assume that you're going to that you're that you're going to accept that. You have to include that there. Again, this is meant for machines to generally query it, not human beings. Um, finally, you have the 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 rest endpoint. That's pretty obvious. Uh, and then this date dash dash data URL and code. We'll just take this data in curl and put it into the request body. Uh, and this will also automatically URL encode it. So for those of you who don't like JSON and don't like reading that, imagine trying to read that URL encoded and trying to type that out. Just replace everything with percents and numbers, and that'll be a lot less fun. Uh, I, I can, because I've had the, man, I've had the nightmare of managing Puppet. Uh, CouchDB for free. Years. I feel and free, man. Well, I'm sorry. But, but it looks like you're creating a similar sort of thing unless you guys get on it and write some client libraries. So I'm getting there. So that we're not all inventing our own. So, so yeah. I mean, one, one thing about this, that there are, I mean, like this, this is this is a really straightforward, easy to use thing. There are there are libraries out there if you want to access that data by hand, and, and I and I will totally get there. I just have a few more slides for it. Right. Um, so um, some other ones that are really helpful uh, are these these SSL ones. So again, because this is using Puppet's built-in SSL libraries. Uh, you want to pull your, your certs and everything from the actual Puppet, from the Puppet uh, directory itself. So the machine that you're querying from should have copies of SSL keys if you're querying externally. If you're running it on localhost or if you're running um, an unencrypted uh, PuppetDB listener, then you can just omit all this stuff. Uh, by default, localhost is plain HTTP and uh, the public listener is SSL encrypted. Uh, what else have we got? Okay, so this one I actually think is really, really helpful because for a while I was typing these queries in at the command line, which took forever, and I kept like scrolling back. By the way, did anybody know how you skip back multiple words in Bash? Um, control right arrow, control left arrow. Yeah, that's in, in GNOME Terminal. I know it works that way. It works way. in XFC too. Yeah, I've, got a, I've just got to reconfigure my, my console to do that because, oh my god, pressing that arrow key. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. The, the I keep, um, key bindings. It's a lot easier. 
Oh yeah, yes. and then you have escape means so much. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should definitely do that. Um, so, anyways, before I before I actually got to that, you can actually write all of these queries into a file, and if you pass data dash dash URL and code um, query at, it's actually going to specify a query field um, in a text file and read it out of that and put that in right there. So you can write these long, complicated, you know, lots of indents. Uh, JSON queries and prefix notation and be able to make those requests to PuppetDB pretty easily. Uh, and so I recommend doing that over typing this all out of the command line, even if your VI bindings are really awesome. Um, so um, just a, a couple of examples of quick filters that I thought were kind of cool as I was looking at them. Uh, this one here, if you hit the, the user endpoint with the regex match on the source file, and then this opt puppet share puppet modules, you can actually get all of the, in this case it's just users, so all the user resources that come from Puppet Enterprise. So if you're trying to figure out why a particular resource is there, this is maybe a particular interest and obviously only of interest to Puppet Enterprise users, but you'll notice that PE gives you a separate module path in addition to the one that you're used to from open source. So your modules could be coming from different places, uh, and if you don't want to grep through your code or actually understand what your code is specifically doing, you can find out exactly what types of resources Puppet um, is providing you uh, through PE to pull those, those, those resources out. Obviously this works for things more than just your uh, Puppet Enterprise installation, and it'll, it'll search for anything. You just need to use this regex match and it will search for anything where the, the source file that your Puppet code came from provided that resource. Because again, all these resources, and you've probably seen it in reports and you saw it before in the endpoint, they say which file and which line of that file that resource was defined in. So I think that one's really helpful. Um, another one here, you can see all of the resources that a specific node exported. So here we're just seeing if the resource is set to exported and the cert name is exporter.example.com, I can find out what resources something was exporting so I could maybe, maybe see like why that node, like what that node is, what the uh, other things that might be relying on that node are in my infrastructure really easily. And from this one, if you think about it, you could probably see a lot of inter-node dependencies by just querying that type of thing and finding out what exported resources are being applied where. Um, Generally speaking, I think it's good to be to write good puppet code where you understand what stuff is going on before it's there, but if you want to find out what's already been applied and is floating out your infrastructure, uh, queries like this can be really, really helpful. Um, so to your to your question about uh, human human accessible ways to get this, there is a puppet face out there called Puppet DB Query that allows you to do all of this in infix notation in a in a really obviously human friendly way. You install this face, it's available as a forge module. Um, and you just say puppet query nodes or puppet query whatever endpoint you're interested in and then you can pass the filter as an argument. So here we say the architecture equals AMD64 instead of equals architecture AMD64. That kind of thing. And it supports compound. Yes, it does. Actually, actually, I ripped this, I ripped this off from the Forge readme. Um, in that example, um, this was actually one query, searching for MySQL server packages on AMD64 machines. So I could just put an AND in there and so the puppet face is the library available also as something that can just be loaded into another app, or is it only you know is it a syntax that's only available from the command? Um, so actually, both. It's available from both. So okay. so the idea with puppet that totally off topic from puppet DB, but the idea with uh, puppet faces mm -hmm. is that you have a direct command line interface and also a versionable API to to interact with puppet itself. So the idea is that faces are written so that you can work with you know maybe the reports in puppet or do things and interact with Puppet directly where all of your Puppet configs are loaded automatically uh, and you can have application APIs call it or you can have command line things call it. It's really cool. Um, uh, I, could, I could get you some links if you're interested in learning more about them, but it's sort of a way to write extension tools for Puppet. In fact, technically almost everything in Puppet where you see this Puppet space something command ever since you stopped seeing like, you know, the Puppet, Puppet D and things like that by itself are actually faces. They're just uh, an API layer in between Puppet and whatever thing you're trying to use. Is this uh, Eric Dolan's uh, Puppet DB query? Yep, it is. Have you worked with, um, he has custom functions for the DSL for querying it also, and so you could like summon like, nodes oh, really? and things like that inside that's, the DSL? That's pretty awesome. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I'll definitely have to check that out though. It's a little bit, bug it's a little bit buggy. Buggy? Yeah. yeah. But it works pretty well. There's a ticket open, and I think James, James wrote the ticket, and he's like, why don't we have this? Like, why isn't this built in? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of what uh, I think a lot of people were hoping when PuppetDB first came out, that it's like, look at all this awesome stuff. Go make it awesome. <laughs> we have other stuff to work on kind of thing. Um, 
but uh, there actually is some pretty cool stuff coming out from Puppet Lab specifically on it, and uh, I think that integration like that is exactly what we were hoping for. So what about inside the templates? Is that like completely insane to do to query these things from in an ERB? Yeah. Generally, I don't think that uh, doing any kind of data lookup in the ERB is a good idea. In fact, I think that ERB should be as simple as possible, uh, mainly because it can get hard to debug them, and they can also add a bit of a performance hit on your catalog compilation. Uh, I would do that query, I think a custom function is a way better place to do that, or a higher backend would be even better, where you pull that data out of higher uh, in the puppet manifest, and then you know your template just spits it out. Um, so, some other cool stuff that's coming up now that, now that you make me mention it is uh, we're looking at uh, report and event endpoints. These are actually built in already. Um, if you use the slash experimental uh, version for the endpoint, you can get these. But the experimental thing means that these APIs could change without notice. So don't build anything that relies absolutely on them. Uh, they're really cool. I'll show you some quick examples uh, in, a, in a sec about what, uh, what those look like. Um, there's also an mCollective discovery plugin, which I think is, is awesome. I don't have a, a demo of that one to show you, but the idea would be that you can actually query this node and fact data out of PuppetDB and use that to build filters to run mCollective commands. Uh, the, the new version of mCollective has pluggable discovery, so instead of only discovering based on things that exist out in your infrastructure currently, you can pull things out from an external data source or a static list or something to run your commands. We should probably even do a Puppet meetup on mCollective at some point, because I think it's really awesome. Okay, um, does anybody have any other questions before I just go into a quick, uh, a very quick demonstration because this is taking a lot more time than I thought it would. Um, okay, I just want to show you guys a few places on the system that are worth looking at for, uh, that are worth looking at um, uh, in public TV. So this is installed in enterprise and I apologize for being enterprise centric but all of my VMs have enterprise ready and, and I'm, you know, I only really go to customer sites that are running Puppet Enterprise. Um, the same principles apply in open source, the paths are just going to be a little bit different. Um, so in opt, puppet, share, puppet DB, we've got all of these things set up. This jar file is basically the thing that puppet DB runs. And then these MQ, DB, and state directories are the temporary places where it dumps things. So <clears throat> I believe that the DLO goes into state. Um, for those of you who are asking about that, I don't actually have an example of a failed query that I can show you. Um, but I think that that's where it goes. I'll double check that for so you. So if I had to pull the um, DLO, uh, I would look at state? Um, so well, no, you actually... Going through the um, experimental endpoint? Um, so for that, actually, there's... there's a, I don't have one for the DLO specifically, um, but there's uh, endpoints to pull metrics out of it specifically, and one of them will tell you how many items are in the DLO. Okay. Um, you, so you would ask PuppetDB what it's got there. Um, also, this, this log directory, and I mean, config, obviously, config. Uh, the logs aren't that interesting, but you can see the one thing I want to highlight in the logs is that we have a transaction ID set for all of these. So when a command comes in, it gets a UUID, and so every single command is, is pretty much unique. And so it's really easy to track these down and find out when things happened and how data got added in. Uh, and you can also see like different different types of queries that they were made. It's, it's actually a really helpful uh, helpful interface. As you can see, um, we we're using a lot of experimental APIs just built right in here. I did not write those those uh, queries that are hitting that. Um, that's a cool thing to look at if you want to just sort of see what it's doing. It writes to those log files on, on each of these queries. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is just some of these uh, other queries we have available like uh, for performance. So I have here a, uh, a memory query. This is going to check what the memory usage is on your Java process. So if I, uh, if I just run this curl command, it can give me back a JSON of all the memory usage that we have available from the Java process. So those of you who have managed Java see that maybe like memory gets, gets away from you. You can pull this data out, um, out programmatically, and there's also a really cool dashboard that I want to show you in a second. Um, so it would be a query, James, kind of like this where you have uh, a met you, you hit the metrics endpoint to pull stuff out for the, the DLO like that. Um, I actually have a, a different one here for the average resources per node. Uh, I don't know how visible this is going to be on that screen, but it looks uh, sort of like that. That's just the endpoint. Metrics and being com.puppetlabs.com. Uh, and then we have type default main average resources per node. And so these are just like, there's all kinds of these metrics here. Um, we have a dashboard built in that I'll show you in a second that is an, another easy way to get all this information out. 
Um, I think I'll skip the other ones because the slides kind of showed it, and again, I'm way over, way over the time I expected. Um, so here is the dashboard that comes built into this. Um, and I'd like to also mention real quick that this, so this dashboard is available. This is not like an enterprise feature or anything. This is built right into PuppetDB. Um, and actually this dashboard was part of the inspiration for, for um, separating Puppet away from the different enterprise components and having a separate enterprise GUI. Uh, the goal is that we'll provide a dashboard or some sort of simple graphical interface for all the tools in our open source ecosystem. So even if there isn't something bigger that you can use to manage it, the hope, is, the hope is that we'll have at least something very simple so that you can access this data really easily and it makes the product still really easy to use. Um, so here we have um, this dashboard that I've had running. I only have one node connected to my Puppet DB, so it's not super interesting. Um, but you can see a bunch of information about how these commands are being processed, what sort of uh, stuff is in the queue, how big your heap size is. Um, uh, resource duplication is, really, is actually a really interesting one. So um, uh, as we, when running this, we found that um, maybe like 85% on average of people's resources are the same across all of their machines. Now again, I only have one machine, so there's obviously no duplicate, duplicate resources. Um, so that, that's 0% right there, but you'll see there sometimes those numbers go up into the 90s, uh, where you just like, you, you uh, dedupe the storage, yep. Oh, you, okay, I was wondering what they use. Oh yeah, the point is, is that it's deduplicated. So, so obviously when you're generating terabytes of data a day of these catalogs, you don't want to store the same thing over and over again. So PuppetDB will dedupe it, and that's why we have uh, these resource and catalog duplication values. Um, <coughs> Also, one thing that's really important when you're looking at uh, your performance monitoring is if that command queue depth starts to get really high, um, then you know you're probably having trouble processing uh, messages as they come in. And so that's a thing that you could look at. So, I mean, like, whenever you see PuppetDB, this is kind of the graphical front that you see. Um, all of this information uh, is also available through those JSON queries. In fact, this, this, this here is not cheating. There's no... There's no like secret sauce that we're using that's not out there and documented. All of this comes from the same performance queries that we have documented on our site. Okay, um, let me hop back into Keynote. So some additional resources for you, docs.puppetlabs.com slash puppetdb is awesome. Um, everything that I said here and much, much more is there. Uh, it, is, it is full of information, complete API guides, um, tutorials on how to use this query API and maybe how to use curl to help you use it. Uh, it's awesome. You can check the source code at, uh, on GitHub. Uh, there's also an issue tracker on projects.puppetlabs.com slash projects slash puppetdb. And of course, Pound Puppet on Freenode, which many of you are probably already all very familiar with. Um, uh, in fact, I think that there are some people, like Deepak maybe in particular, have highlights set so that if you say Puppet DB and Pound Puppet, they'll like be summoned and they'll wake up and come help you. Uh, really cool. There's my contact information if anybody wants to uh, get in touch, ask me any questions about anything else. I'm, I'm not exactly a super expert on Puppet DB. I've basically just given you guys almost the complete extent of my knowledge. Um, but I can definitely find people who know more than I do if you have questions that baffle me. So feel free to get that down and, and bother me at all hours. Uh, and that's about it. Any other questions? Are you get the slides? Yeah, I'll give you the slides. Mm -hmm. uh, is there like a place that I can upload these, maybe with the video? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Anything else? No? Okay, cool. Well, thanks, guys. Thank